Good morning. Isn't it great to have kids in the house today? Let's let them know how much we're glad they're around. Um, let me just pray real quick for you today. And uh, if we're grateful you're in the room. You got up on a cold and snowy day and uh, came to a warm place. And if you're at home, you didn't have to leave to find a warm place. But I want to be able to pray something into your heart and life today. So if you could just bow, bow your heads. Uh, Father, um, there's a thing we can do that masks disappointment and hopelessness in our own lives. Uh, we actually come to a place where we don't think things are going to change. We become cynical. And the horrible truth about cynicism is it takes away our expectation and makes us feel superior about it. So would you help us today to have the imagination to see what you could do and to not be afraid to trust and believe in that. In Jesus' name, amen. So does anybody care who wins the Super Bowl today? It's that wonderful time of year when fans of 30 teams have to watch someone else play. And we have no options, right? There's nobody else playing, just them. So glad you're here. We're in a series called Integrity. And what we've been talking about is how, how to become the kind of person we always hoped and dreamed we would be. And we've defined integrity as, as the capacity or the ability to meet the demands of reality. And so this morning we're going to look at so what goes wrong? We all, I think, desire to be a person of integrity, but we often fall short of that. Why is that true? And today we're going to find an important key as to why it's true and an important key as to how to move past that sense of being stuck. So we're in Romans uh, chapter 12, and it tells us, uh, and I'm only reading two verses today, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So once again, integrity is the ability to meet the demands of reality. So who defines reality? Uh, a lot of times when we think about our life, we think in terms of what we would like to do, what we want to do. And that's actually a healthy thing. It's one of the things that individuates you from others. Your goals and ambitions might be different than someone else's, and that's, that can be a very healthy thing. The challenge is, is that when it comes to our desires, sometimes we just want things because we've been told we should want them. And sometimes we want things that aren't the most healthy for us. So how do we work through that process? And uh, what we need is some information that clarifies that for us. I think a lot of people desire to know what God's will is. You know, what's God's will for my life? That's the most asked question I get asked as a pastor. A second most question I get asked as a, as a pastor from parents is, will there be pets in heaven? Because something happened to little Skippy, and now uh, they've got to say something to their kids about that. What would you do if you had more time? What would you want to learn? What would you want to become? Uh, Learning and becoming takes time. You don't just decide and then you are. It takes time. I think a lot of people want uh, their spiritual life to be something like a psychedelic experience. 
and it just reorients your brain and then everything you see after that feels a little bit different. We would like our spiritual formation to be instant. We would like our integrity to grow instantly. We, would, we wish we could come to a place like this and then God would drop something into us and then we would walk out of this place fully empowered people of integrity without learning and without becoming. And don't misunderstand me. There are things that God does instantly, but there are some things that take time. For example, when you place your faith in Christ, you decide to trust him. Uh, he actually, there's instant forgiveness. That doesn't take any time. You're completely forgiven. You, you are instantly accepted by God. That doesn't take any time. You are instantly given the gift of eternal life. That doesn't take any time. But spiritual formation is a process, not an event. Spiritual formation is a process. It's not an event. Becoming a person of integrity is a process. It's not an event. And until we understand this, we're always going to be frustrated with ourselves and our capacity to meet the demands of reality. Uh, if you've had children, you know children don't grow up overnight. It takes almost two decades to get them to a place physically and emotionally where they can be on their own and perform reasonably well. You are not a video game that God is playing. You are a child of his that he is nurturing. He's growing you. It's not like you're just going to have downloaded some kind of superpower and now everything becomes easy. That's not the goal. So a lot of people beat themselves up because they think that their spiritual life is supposed to be an event rather than a process. Here's the thing to understand about the process. You cannot change your life without changing the way you think. If you think the same way, you will behave the same way. Something has to happen with how we think. If you want to grow in integrity, then you have to get intentional about what you think and how you think. We have to get some insight on this. That's why this passage says that if you really want to take steps forward, what has to happen is your mind has to be renewed. We have to renew our mind. So we have two basic options. One is to conform, right? Paul says, don't be conformed by the world. So we can conform. And conform means basically changing your appearance. The, the original meaning of the word has to do with uh, kind of putting uh, fashion on, all right? Um, some people, how many know someone who they're a little more fashion conscious? Like uh, if, if you see them, and they look different than other people, it's because they are on the cutting edge of fashion. And eventually, everyone else is gonna look like them. And then how many know someone that you are the exact opposite of cutting edge of fashion? You are wearing what you wore back in high school. Nothing has changed. Uh, it, it's literally the same t-shirt. And, uh, and, and you don't wanna get rid of it, all right? So, the, the point is, is that what we often do is just like fashion. Think about this. We see things that are changing in the culture, and then we want to be like that because we've been told that that's what's acceptable. And by the way, if we're out of step with our fashion, we will have friends that come along and tell us, well, you know, you should probably upgrade your wardrobe just a little bit. And then we see people on television and people in the movies and people online and they're all looking like this. So then we conform. We put on that so we fit in, right? And uh, that's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't think God has called Christians to just dress weird. Um, but renewing your mind is not just complying with whatever the current culture tells you is the way to think about things. So there's another option, and that option is to transform. To transform. So transform, the concept there is a rebirth, it's a metamorphosis, it's the, the, the same kind of process that you see a, a, a caterpillar become a butterfly, right? 
a caterpillar actually transforms. You don't just strap teeny tiny wings to a caterpillar and then he learns to use them. That's not what's happening. Something else is going on. What is happening that allows him to be transformed? We have to think about this. So there's a process. And in our integrity, in our spiritual life, that process requires Paul said it in the passage, a renewing of our mind. The key to transformation is renewing your mind. The same Holy Spirit that brought you to rebirth, a new birth in Christ, which by the way, wasn't instantaneous. Anybody who's a parent in the room, you've had that experience where there was conception and then there was nine months of a baby growing in a, room, in a womb and then the baby came. Nobody thought that the baby just suddenly appeared on the day of its delivery. And so when we're born into the kingdom of God, there's this kind of conception. There's a work that the Spirit does that gets us to the point of decision. And uh, that can take uh, longer or shorter for some people. That's not the point. The point is, is that the moment you made a decision, that was the completion of some things that the Holy Spirit was already doing. But just like rebirth takes a work of the Spirit that, that brings you to a decision, so renewing your mind takes a work of the Spirit. And this is how our life begins to be transformed. Uh, we may picture the life that God calls us to live, but we often feel like we're unable to live it. And there's a conflict internal within us. And that conflict is usually the thoughts that we think about what's possible or what's even preferable. And we might assume when we look at some of God's instructions is that, well, those are the instruction he gave to people who were simpler and lived a long time ago. The world wasn't as complicated back then. I think this is one of the things our culture does. We, we have an air of superiority that because we have amazing computing power in our pockets, that somehow we are actually more complex beings than existed in previous generations. And what I can tell you is humans are amazingly complex and they always have been. Technology has improved, but people are pretty much people. And so our assumptions is that, well, if God were giving instructions today, he would update it based on our complexities and based on current trends. And, and that's a misunderstanding of God. So many times we look at some of the things that God has to say, and our problem is, is that it, it's not just that we, we're frustrated by something that he wants us to do or doesn't want us to do. We don't understand the why. It doesn't make any sense to us. And because we've never learned to think how he thinks about that. You can work up some energy to try to do it for a little while or not do it for a little while, but eventually your energy runs out. So we can have wrong ideas and misperceptions about a lot of beliefs. What you believe determines how you behave. What you believe determines how you behave. I'm not saying that there aren't things that you think are good ideas, but that's not the same thing as believing them. I don't know anybody who thinks that it's bad to eat healthy. I know lots of people who don't eat healthy. There are lots of times I don't eat healthy. Right? This right here, that's this, the amount of space for eight Oreo cookies. <laughs> There's a reason I know that. Uh, there is no doctor on the planet that will tell you eating eight of those things in a sitting is going to make you healthier. I know that. Why do I do that? I don't know. <laughs> They're good. Do, do you see the challenge? Is that we can have heard a lot of things. We can even agree with those ideas, but that doesn't mean we believe it. People, please listen, people consistently behave out of what they believe. When you see someone doing something, they are not doing something that is different from what they believe. They are living out their belief. Now, they may tell you, that's not what I believe, but 
there's another belief that actually made that possible. And usually it's the kind of belief that says, well, I'm just nobody, I'm not worth anything, I'm never gonna have anything unless I'm willing to, and then they act out of that. But it's people consistently act out of their beliefs. We live in a world that has formed our thoughts, that has taught us what we should think, what we should desire, how we should go about life. And when things don't work, we assume that there's something wrong with us. Not that the belief system was wrong, but that there's something wrong with us. And that has guided our actions. For example, if you believe in, um, in, in that happiness comes from getting more stuff, if I have more, I will be happier. Lots of people believe that. If you believe that, how generous are you going to be? Not very. If you believe that people cannot be trusted, lots of people believe that. Some of us in this room have been told that by important people in our lives. We've been told that by our parents. We've been told that by our spouse. We've told ourselves that. So if you believe that people cannot be trusted, how many close friends do you think you're going to have? We have to have something that challenges these concepts that we hold in our minds, and we have to be willing to be renewed. Renewed. If we want to renew our minds, we need to identify false assumptions. What are the false things? So uh, let's give an example of this. Let's suppose that there's a person, a guy, um, he's a believer in Christ, he goes to church regularly, he's reasonably familiar with scripture, he's married, he has a wife, and uh, let's also say that the, the marriage is not what he hoped and dreamed it would be. In fact, it's an ongoing source of disappointment to him. He's worked on this a long time and there doesn't seem to be any change. So there may be some false assumptions that are, that are embedded into his thinking. For example, sometimes we think it's our responsibility to fix our spouse. That's why God put me in this relationship, to fix you. The Bible does not say, husbands, fix your wives. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives. Not the same thing. Some people see love as just a tool that you use to get what you want. And if that tool doesn't work, try another tool. Some people believe in the power of rejection. You give an ultimatum. If you don't change, then I am not going to be part of this relationship anymore. Now, you might get some conforming behavior on that, but nothing gets transformed. And eventually things go back the way that they were. It's not a good solution. Rejection doesn't work. Our world has achieved stunning success in how it has programmed us. Television, music, movies, online, podcasts, conversations with friends. We are told what's important. We are told how to think. We are shown someone who looks successful and they tell us, this is how I got that way and you should be this too. The programming constantly gives us a set of assumptions that we struggle with. If you want your identity, or if you want to identify your false assumptions, how do you go about that? And here's some ways I would recommend. First of all, listen to what you say. If you want to identify your false assumptions, listen to the things that you say. For example, someone might say this, well, I've always been this way. Well, that may be true, but the assumption is if I've always been this way, then I can't be any different than this. And that's not true. You might hear yourself say, well, everybody's doing it. And the assumption here is, is that if it's common, God doesn't care. If our culture just accepts this, then God kind of grades on a curve. That's how it works. Or you might hear yourself say this, I can handle it. And that's, a, that's an assumption that if I have assessed that the hurt or the harm of my behavior is not too great, then I can absorb that and no one really gets hurt except maybe me. And what, I'm, what I want you to know is that what that false assumption is, I don't need anyone else's help to discern or to get through anything. I can handle it. Another thing that we can say, one time won't hurt because we know the first time we do anything, 
nothing happens. It's only when we repeat it and repeat it and repeat it that we start bearing consequences, right? No, it's a, it's a false assumption, but how many of our culture assume that that could be true? Nobody will know as though the only consequence for unhealthy attitudes and actions is just the embarrassment of someone else finding out. I've read some studies recently where they have taken things that most people across cultures would agree was a bad thing, and then they, they find out if the person will agree it's a bad thing, and they do, and then they will give them a good reason why it might be okay, and then they will ask them, or they will say, if no one was watching, would you consider doing it? They've already identified it's a horrible thing they would never do, and if they have a good reason and anonymity, they, they say, yep, I might do that. That's the power of the programming of our culture. So listen to what you say. Identify areas where you're extra sensitive, because we do get a little sensitive. If you find yourself strongly reacting to things, then that's an indication that there's a false assumption underlying and it's being challenged and you're not managing that well. You can examine, examine your strongest temptations. What are the things that keep capturing you and dragging you back into them? You can assess areas where you have excessive fear. There are some fears that are rational. There are some fears that are not rational. By the way, you can't tell a rational fear from an irrational fear, fear by how you feel about it. There are some things that paralyze us in life, and it has to do with a set of false assumptions. The key to renewing our mind is to allow God to challenge our assumptions. If our, if our assumptions go unchallenged, we'll never change. We'll never become the people or the people of integrity that God hopes and dreams for us. If you want to eliminate a false assumption, then you not only have to challenge it, you actually have to replace it with something. And so the, the, we, we need to look for truth. Information doesn't guarantee transformation. Just hearing a thing doesn't mean it will happen for you. You need a strategy to apply that truth. Why is this important? Because when Jesus came, he didn't come, and, and this was his message, try harder. Right? If you examine most messages throughout Christianity, there's three points. God is good. You are not. Try harder. And that's not the gospel. Jesus doesn't come and say, try harder. Jesus comes and does something for us and in us that begins to transform us. So he took our sins, that's part of what he did, and he gives us his life. That's part of what he did. And some of us have only accepted the, 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 the forgiveness of sin part, but there's a life that he wants to impart to us. This is how we can become people of integrity. So if you want to renew your mind, speak truth. Don't just seek truth. Say it. Say it out loud. Use your voice. You don't have to scream, but there's something incredibly powerful about your ears hearing your mouth say truth. There's also something very disintegrating when your ears hear your mouth say something that's not true. We have to learn how to speak the truth. Speak the truth. We need to personalize the truth. It's not just a truth. It can be a truth that applies to me. It can be my truth. For example, uh, when you're reading scripture, this is a, a great exercise that you can do. You can personalize the scripture. Isaiah 26, it says this, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is steadfast because he trusts in you. You can say it like this. You will keep me in perfect peace when my mind is steadfast because I trust in you. You can personalize that truth. Philippians 4, 19 says, my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. You can say, my God will meet my needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Don't just seek truth, speak truth. And pray truth. Ask God to help you do what his word calls you to do. Ask for an opportunity to act on the truth. Ask for courage. Ask for an opportunity to be brave. Ask for those things. 
pray that truth out. Don't just hope it happens. Invite God to help it happen. And then meditate on truth. I'm not talking about some mystical experience. Uh, let's just check this morning real quick. How many here have at least on one occasion in your life found yourself worrying about something? There you go. And, and uh, how many, it's been way more than once. How many have worried since you've been in the room? How many are worried that you raised your hand and a lot of other people didn't? It's worrying. Meditation is similar to worrying, only on a positive side instead of a negative one. Meditation is thinking about how something could be. If I applied this, if this was true, if I lived this out, what would that look like? And you just think about that. You let that imagination begin to rise up on the inside of you. See? When we do those things, not only is our assumptions, our, our assumptions challenged, but they begin to be replaced. And our integrity grows when we partner with God, not just when we try to prove ourselves to God. We need to partner with him. Allow him to challenge the false assumptions. If we just accept our culture's programming, we're going to do a lot of pretending and we're going to do a lot of quitting and we're going to become angrier and we're going to become more discouraged and we're going to become more afraid. And this is not the life that God has called us to. So I'm gonna ask the worship team to come out. What are you telling yourself? What programming kind of increases your anger or your fear? What temptations are you facing that keep controlling your options? Integrity is a process. And it happens when we allow our minds to be renewed. It requires some humility. There are things that I think that might not be true. There are things that I don't know yet. And if you allow God to begin to impart truth and you speak truth and you personalize truth and you pray truth and you meditate on truth, think about these things. It's amazing what process begins in your heart. Let's bow our heads this morning. Um... The, the picture that kind of comes to my mind is a picture of um, someone, they're, they're kind of bent over and their hands are in front of them. It looks like they're in a fighting position, but they're not. They're just being pummeled all the time. Every direction. There's so many people. And it, life makes no sense to them. They just keep absorbing these body blows. And the fear is, I don't know how much more of this I can take. And maybe you've been knocked down more than once. Things just didn't hurt. They, they took your feet out from under you. And you started making the assumption that maybe this faith stuff works for people who are smarter than I am or healthier than I am or holier than I am, whatever it is. And here's what I want you to know. You have to hear this this morning. All of God's gifts are available to you if you are willing to trust him. But it comes from renewing our minds. There's some things we just have to let go of. We've been told they are true. They have not been true. And they're undoing our lives. And God wants to breathe truth in and raise life up in each and every one of us. So Father, today help us. Uh, we've all had areas where it just feels like life is not working. Can you help us understand today? that we don't just need to find a new practice and try it, that we need to have our minds renewed 
and see where that leads us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together this morning.